Hi, my name is Gabe Hayos. I'm Vice President of the Tax for the CICA. And I'm going to present to you as part of the CICA's Financial Literacy Series on Effective Tax Strategies. Just to begin, as you know in the area of tax, uh, it's an area that's ever-changing and uh, more importantly, we at the CIC are not in the business of giving specific tax advice, so the comments that you see here should be uh, taken uh, and uh, checked if you're actually trying to do any planning or considerations in this area, so uh, please uh, take these comments, but uh, uh, make sure that you follow through and check them to make sure there hasn't been any change in interpretation of law or any change in tax law. Uh, so what uh, we're going to do today is take you through uh, some basic tax strategies that, uh, that anybody that uh, is going to be filing a tax return needs to know about. Um, we'll talk to you about how it's important to understand the basics in tax law, uh, some simple but important tax planning ideas, uh, planning your goals and how to achieve them. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about some resources that are available to you. Now what is financial literacy? First, uh, the Canadian government has uh, recognized that this is an important area and put together uh, a committee to, to deal with financial literacy. And essentially financial li literacy is having the knowledge, skills and confidence uh, to make responsible financial decisions. And hopefully what you'll find in, in this presentation is some key factors that will help you be able to do that. So first, understanding tax law. Obviously, the more that you know, the better you'll be able to make your decisions. One of the things that you should know is that uh, taxpayers do have rights. There is something referred to as a taxpayer bill of rights. There are actually 15 rights that taxpayers have, and illustrated on the slides are just a few of them. To be treated professionally, courteously, and fairly. To have privacy and confidentiality. Uh, to a formal review and appeal process. And one of the things that you need to know, and it's an important uh, avenue for you to deal with uh, matters when you have problems with uh, the Revenue Authority, is the tax ombudsman. The tax ombudsman is Paul Dubay, and he has uh, about 35 people working for him. And he's there to help you deal with disputes. He doesn't have responsibility for all 15 of the taxpayer's Bill of Rights, but he does have responsibility for a number of them. And those basically uh, relate to things like being treated fairly, uh, being explained what the tax laws are if you have a dispute, and making sure that uh, there's proportionality. So if, uh, if you don't have a large amount of tax at dispute, that the CRA doesn't put you through uh, a, a lot of cost and, uh, and bother to try to settle a, a dispute. So that's very important. There are some wonderful resources that the CRA has, and if you just go to their website, and we'll, uh, we at the back of this uh, presentation have, a, have the, uh, the link to it, they have some excellent information that all taxpayers uh, should uh, take a look at, which will help you in uh, planning your tax affairs and, and actually doing your personal tax returns. Typically, uh, the, uh, you should be able to uh, do your own tax preparation if you don't have complex uh, uh, tax matters. What uh, you should recognize is that there is very uh, relatively inexpensive tax software that can make this quite uh, simple for you to prepare your tax returns. If in fact you have more complex tax situations, you may have a death in the family, you may have uh, an inheritance from uh, a family member, then it may be appropriate for you to seek uh, uh, tax advice and certainly uh, many of our practicing CAs are, are very knowledgeable in this area and you can seek them out for, for special tax assistance. So the issue in planning is just that, that you have to plan ahead. And the, the more you plan ahead, the better you're able to make sure that you uh, don't have surprises and that you can, in fact, uh, minimize your, your tax affairs. Planning ahead really means that uh, when you're preparing your tax return for this year, you're actually, that's not when you're planning for this year, you're actually planning for next year. So uh, if your tax returns are due April 30th, uh, you're planning not for the tax return that you're then filing, but you're planning for the, the tax return for the following year, and that's going to give you a chance to do things like consider uh, 
what your goals are. Are you helping to uh, get your children through a school? Are you planning for retirement? Do you need to think about uh, how you allocate income among family members? These are all things that you need to think about at the time that you are preparing your tax returns. Um, generally, what you do in the area of tax is you see if you can to defer income. Not easy because uh, there are many instances where you're not able to do it, but there are also opportunities as we'll discuss further in this presentation. You'll also, where possible, try to accelerate deductions and you'll try to make sure that you take advantage of all possible tax credits. And this presentation will take you through uh, a number of those items that you should uh, give consideration to. Now one of the very important things to do both in terms of preparing the, uh, your tax return and also in order to be uh, prepared in the event that you get any queries from the CRA is to keep very good and detailed records. And you'll have to keep your tax slip, bills and other documents, credit card statements, receipts. And generally you'll want to keep these for a period of about six years. And it really is critical that if you have these well organized, you can respond very easily to CRA questions. If you don't, then the whole process of an audit or even just answering queries can be very difficult and complex. So how, how do you go about achieving your goals of reducing income, accelerating expenses, making sure that you deal with credits? First off, you need to think about uh, the planning in terms of income recognition. Now, as an employee, uh, you actually have very few options because the income tax is quite strict in terms of when you recognize income and very limited in terms of expenses that you can claim. We'll, we'll talk about a few of them. If you're self-employed, you have a much greater flexibility to both uh, uh, claim expenses because anything related to conducting your business can generally be deductible and you may have some greater flexibility in how you have the timing of recognition of, of some of your, your income. One of the areas where all individuals have flexibility is in the area of timing of recognition of capital gains and capital losses. That is, if you uh, make investments in shares, for example, in public company shares, you can decide whether you sell those shares prior to a calendar year end or you sell them after a calendar year. And so, for example, if you have significant capital gains on some shares, you may decide to wait to sell them after December 31st of the year that you're in. Uh, whereas if you have capital losses, you may decide to sell them just prior to the year end so that you can recognize them earlier. Of course, you have to factor in not just the tax issues. Tax should never be the sole driving force because if there are, there are business considerations, and obviously if you have a nice gain in your shares, and you decide to hold it for a, a few weeks or months longer, there's a, you, you, you take some financial risk in that the stock might uh, change in value during that period of time. One of the things you need to recognize is that uh, it's very important to be careful in terms of how you structure your affairs. So if you borrow um, to make personal uh, acquisitions, if you borrow to buy a house, if you borrow to buy a fur coat, if you borrow for a, a car uh, for personal use as opposed to business, then that interest is not deductible. On the other hand, if you borrow for investment purposes or borrow to, make an, uh, uh, to invest in your business, that interest is deductible. So you need to be very careful to trace where your borrowing is going. You want to borrow for those items that do create tax deductible interest and use available cash for those things where interest is not deductible. So this, this is a, a very important planning. The other thing that you'll want to do is consider who the higher income earner is and the lower income earner. If you're the higher income earner, you'll want to make sure that you're the one that's getting the interest expense deduction. If you're the lower income earner, you'll want to be the one that perhaps is paying for personal items where interest is not deductible because as we'll show, illustrate with some of the tax rate tables we have, it's much better to have a tax deduction at the higher tax rate than it is at the lower tax rate. The comment, uh, the last bullet in this slide is, is an interesting one in that often people are very excited when they file their tax returns and they get a tax refund. And uh, in fact, you probably haven't done your planning very well if you got a tax refund. The idea is to have your 
uh, when you file your tax return to actually be as close to zero, not owing money to the government and having, not having the government owe you money is the best planning of all. Of course, it's not always possible to be perfect, but if, for example, you've got a large refund from the government, what it means is that you've actually put on deposit money with the government and they're not paying you any interest on it. And so uh, that is clearly not the most effective thing possible. So be very careful to try to pay the right amount of tax. If you're an employee, you may find that there are circumstances where you either make some special RSP contributions or you're taking a, a course where the tuition is deductible, where you may be able to uh, file a form to reduce your installment payments and, uh, and ensure that at the time that you file your tax return, you're just paying the right amount of tax, not more, not less. Now this is a very important table to illustrate uh, the graduated tax rates because people do not always understand that, uh, for example, if you're a fortunate person that's making over $132,000, your tax rate is not 46% in total because everybody pays at the various graduated. It's an average of all the rates going through the various tables. So that uh, the 46% person has more of a, an average rate of something in the 33% rate, but every dollar that that person makes over $132,000 is taxed at 46%. This is an Ontario table. It varies by province and, of course, by year. This is 2012 and uh, based on federal budgets and uh, uh, perhaps uh, other adjustments to, uh, to uh, various elements of the tax computations. This can change year to year, so you'll always need to check this every year. Now, what's really important to uh, to see in this slide is the tax rate on different types of income. And this is important when you're trying to decide what you invest in, for example. You can see that the normal tax rate has it from 20%, let's say, down to 46%. So that would apply to something like interest income. So if you earn $100 of interest income and you're earning more than $132,000, let's say, from uh, your employment, then you're actually paying $46 for every $100 worth of interest income that you earn. On the other hand, if you had a hundred dollar capital gain, you would have only paid twenty-three dollars for every hundred dollars worth of capital gain that you incurred. And then if you go across and you take a look at eligible dividends, and eligible dividends, technical term, but for the purpose of this presentation, just assume that it's generally dividends paid from a public company, you would be paying roughly twenty-nine dollars for every hundred dollars and non-eligible dividends, you might assume, are coming from private companies. You'd be paying $32 if you're at the, the top tax rate. So when you're deciding your investments and the return you have, you can't just look at, for example, a, a dividend, a stock that pays dividends, and just look at the gross value of the dividend, factor in the amount of tax you have to pay on that dividend, versus, say, a bond where you're earning interest, and you'll compare the after-tax cost, uh, after-tax return, on interest versus dividends and deciding how to compare those instruments. So this is very important. It also shows you how you want to, wherever possible, and there are complex rules in the Act actually to prevent you from splitting income, but there are also rules that allow you to do it. Wherever possible, you're trying to get as much income into the lower, the, the lower earning person in your family, and uh, that will help you save money. If you have somebody earning in this, you know, in this bracket and somebody in this bracket, you can see that uh, every dollar that, uh, that is earned by this person between the eighteen dollars and $39,000 range will have a savings of at least 26% uh, on each of those dollars. So very important to, to see that you can split income where it is legally possible. One of the ways that you can reduce income is with registered retirement savings plans. And this is the most important way for people to save that are not otherwise part of pension plans. And even those people that are part of pension plans may have some ability to, to also contribute to a registered retirement savings plan or an RSP. Essentially what happens with an RSP is the contribution that you make to the RSP is tax deductible. Very important. It's tax deductible and back at the rates that we showed, if you're at the top tax rate, you actually get a deduction at 46%. The income that's earned in the RSP is not taxed. And it's not taxed as long as it's kept in the RSP, and presumably it's kept until retirement. 
and uh, on retirement there's the, there's a method for either taking it out as an annuity or taking it out through a registered retirement income fund and that uh, at that point the income is is taxed but presumably it's a long time down the road in the meantime you've had the uh, opportunity to defer tax and hopefully accumulate income one of the things too to note about RRSPs is that uh, we saw that capital gains are taxed at a different rate than dividends and interest. As a rule, you'd rather have in your RRSP income that's taxed at the highest possible rate because that's giving you the best opportunity for deferral. So if you are putting capital gains in here, the, def the deferral of tax is not as advantageous as if you're putting an interest-bearing uh, instrument in here. Still, in overriding all of that, the most important thing you want to do in an RSP, of course, is make good investments. And you want to make conservative investments because you, if, you get a, if you have a loss in your RSP, you don't get to deduct it. So you're trying to be conservative in your RSP. The comment about automatic, uh, having your employer make automatic monthly contributions for you is just the idea that that's a, it's planning, it's making sure that you put money aside. Um, uh, because often what we'll do is if we wait till the end of the year, we'll have spent it. The earlier you put your money in an RSP, the more uh, that you have the time value of money working for your benefit. One of the interesting things and a good, uh, good planning opportunity is that for young people to try to put as much in early because they can actually take out from their RSP up to $25,000 as a loan to purchase uh, their first home. And interestingly enough, it, it really is like borrowing from yourself uh, and it's similar to borrowing from the bank in that it has to be a commercial terms and a real loan that has to be repaid over a period of at least 15, uh, no longer than 15 years. While you don't get the deduction on the interest, uh, assuming you're using it to buy your home, you don't also pay tax on the income and it's income that's going for your benefit. There's also opportunities to take money out of an RSP if you're you know, doing certain learning upgrades and uh, the comment here is a very important one, and that is, uh, and keep this in mind for any young kids, is that uh, while you can't contribute to an RSP until you're 18 years of age or over, you can accumulate the opportunity to build room to contribute to an RSP as soon as you start to work. And so uh, children should be filing tax returns uh, as soon as uh, they start to earn income from summer jobs or part-time jobs or what have you. That income uh, will create contribution room and when they're ready to make a contribution to an RSP, they'll have a lot more a lot larger opportunity to make a contribution. Essentially, you're able to put 18% of your earned income into an RSP and it's earned income from the prior year. So if in the current year, you, you can make a contribution based on 18% of your earned income in the previous year. And to the extent you don't make a contribution to the RSP in that year, it rolls forward and is accumulated for the, the time that you do uh, plan to make a contribution. The limit for uh, 2012 is $22,000. As I mentioned, uh, you, you will have to collapse your RSP at the age of 71, but there are a couple of options. So you don't end up paying tax immediately on it. You'll end up uh, either through a registered retirement income fund or an annuity paying that tax out over a period of time. One of the things that the Income Tax Act allows, this is where income splitting is really important, is that you can make a spousal contribution. So the spouse that earns the higher amount of income will typically contribute to a spousal plan. That means that the wife is the one, or the husband, whoever is the one that's earning the lower income, is the one that is uh, able to, uh, will pay the tax on the income when the money is withdrawn from the RSP. So you want it to be the lower income earning person. So contributions to a spousal RSP are a wonderful way to, to split income. And as, as I mentioned earlier and very important in planning is that you don't have to claim your RSP deduction in the year you make a contribution. And even if you don't make a contribution, as long as you file your returns, you build up RSP room. Why that's important is typically you'll want to claim your RSP deduction in years when you have the highest amount of income. So if, for example, you're a student and you've accumulated some RSP room but you don't have a lot of uh, tax to pay because you're making very little income and you might have a tuition uh, tax credit as well, you may save your deduction of the RSP till a year when you're fully employed and paying tax at one of the higher rates that we saw in that tax table. 
Now, another important planning opportunity for uh, parents who have uh, children is a registered education savings plan. And essentially the way that the registered education savings plan works is that uh, you can make a contribution to a registered plan, you being a parent or a grandparent for your children or grandchildren, and the con unlike an RSP, the contribution is not deductible, but the income that's earned in the plan is not taxable, and it's not taxable until it's uh, removed, and, and it can only be take it can be taken out uh, for qualified education purposes, paying tuitions for universities. When it is taken out, the person who pays the tax is the student, not the parent. And again, assuming the student is a low income earner, has no tax at that point, then it's a fabulous way to do income splitting. And one of the real values, aside from hopefully any good return that you can get on a tax-free basis in the RSP, is the government uh, will give you a grant of up to 20% on the first $2,500 of your annual contributions. And frankly, that's a wonderful way to boost uh, the amount of money you have available to help uh, support your children when they, uh, when they go to university or other educa higher education. Now, there is also something called the Registered Disability Savings Plan, and it, uh, it operates very similar to the Registered Education Savings Plan, and it deals with, uh, with children who have disabilities. And again, the concept here is that the, uh, while there's no tax deduction for contributions into this plan, the income that's accumulating is accumulated tax-free, and to the extent it's needed to assist the disabled child, it can be uh, paid out, and it's the disabled child that pays the tax, presumably at very at very low tax rates. RSPs, RESPs, and registered disability savings plans, they all provide opportunities for tax savings and also income splitting. These are legislated, so you don't need to get into complex planning to split income. These are all uh, ways that you can split income among your family members. The tax-free savings account is a relatively new um, vehicle, very important vehicle. The limit's $5,000 a year, and what happens with this uh, tax-free savings account is that you're allowed to put $5,000 into the plan, and the income in the plan accumulates tax-free. Now, you don't get a deduction for making a contribution to the tax-free savings account, but what is really wonderful about it is if you withdraw money from the tax-free savings account, you also don't pay tax. So it's quite flexible, and while you can't withdraw and put in in the same year, you have to wait a year. It's a wonderful way if you have short-term money that you want to accumulate in a tax-free basis for you to put it into a tax-free savings account and pay no tax. It's also important to recognize that let's say that you put $5,000 into a, a tax-free savings account and earned $100 on it, and you took $5,100 out of the tax-free savings account. You actually can put $5,100 back into the tax-free savings account the following year or several years down the road, along with whatever your annual contribution limit is for the following years. So you're actually building room even, even uh, just by leaving it there and then ultimately taking it out. It's a very flexible vehicle that uh, really people should be taking advantage of to uh, the maximum extent possible. The comment here is an interesting planning one, not just with spouses, but potentially with children, and that is to make sure that every family member takes maximum use of this plan, if, depending on family arrangements, you may be able to gift money to your uh, various family members who can make contributions to these tax-free savings accounts and makes, make maximum use out of it. I think that uh, very similar to uh, the comment I made on RSPs is you want to be quite conservative in your tax-free savings account. If you lose money on it, that's uh, not deductible and actually you, you've, you've sort of lost contribution room. You can't put more money back in later, so you want to be conservative. And you also want to recognize that since you're not paying tax on the income, you'd like to put income in there that's taxed at the highest rate. So the common is if you can put in interest-bearing securities, that's certainly the least, uh, the, you know, the least risky pot potentially GICs, um, and you, you know, you'll get a reasonable return. But again, this is always a, a risk-reward analysis that people will have to take into account in deciding how to invest. The comment here, as I mentioned earlier, is just be careful about not withdrawing in the same, you can't take money out and then put it back in the same year because there will be a penalty and that's the, the issue. 
So make sure that if you do take it out, you have to wait at least a year before you recontribute money back into it. There are also some complexities if for whatever reason you decide to change financial institutions and move your tax-free savings account, but they'll, they'll, you'll have assistance from the financial institutions in making sure you do that appropriately. Um, I mentioned uh, the, the issues of how to reduce taxable income and this idea that uh, you can make sure that you have uh, investment interest that's, uh, that's tax deductible, uh, make sure that you identify things like alimony and other child care expenses to, uh, to uh, make sure that you maximize those deductions that are available to you. Uh, we talked about the whole issue of deferring capital gains and potentially accelerating capital losses and that these are at your discretion and making sure that you take into account um, also the market risk, not just the tax risk. The Income Tax Act actually allows couples to split pension income, so this is a real attraction for uh, retired people or people earning pension income, and especially when there's significant uh, differences in the tax rates between one spouse and the other spouse. Of course, those who are uh, employed or, or uh, and using their car for business purposes can claim uh, their motor vehicle. Uh, there's also opportunities to make donations if that's part of your plan and to do it with shares and if you donate shares you can actually uh, save on any capital gains tax that you might otherwise pay and still get a charitable donations deduction. And uh, on the capital gains side one of the very interesting things to make sure you're aware of is that uh, Principal residences are not subject to capital gains tax and you, however, each family unit can only have, that's husband, wife, and any dependent children can only have one principal residence. So the idea that uh, you could uh, say your cottage and your house are principal residences is not possible. But there is a bit of planning that you'll have to do to decide which is the more valuable property in terms of claiming which is your, which is your principal residence. One of the things that's not always understood and that's important for people to be aware of is the difference between a tax deduction, like interest expense that we talked about, and a tax credit, like we'll go through some of the credits that we, uh, in some, uh, in some uh, later slides. And that is a tax deduction, as you see, actually reduces your income, and then that income is subject to tax. So if you have a tax deduction of $10,000, whatever your tax rate is, that's the value of the tax deduction. So for example, persons with a marginal tax rate of $31 would get the benefit of $3,100 on a tax deduction. That's different than a tax credit because a tax credit is a dollar for dollar reduction of your actual tax liability. So you're not multiplying your, your tax rate against the deduction. The credit actually reduces dollar for dollar your tax liability. So when you're trying to compare deductions to credits, you want to make sure that you're comp you're comparing them the appropriate way. The whole concept of taking your uh, tax deductions you know, on a timely basis, obvious. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're claiming all the necessary exemptions uh, that are available to you. We talk about some of the common deductions that are available, child care expenses. Very important to keep your records and claim those expenses. If you're moving, if you're moving more than 40 kilometers for employment, uh, wonderful opportunity to deduct moving expenses. In fact, there's some negotiation you, you can do with your employer where you may be better off having less salary and more moving expenses uh, to allow you uh, a more effective uh, tax situation. Of course, uh, union dues, uh, safety deposit boxes, investment council fees if you uh, have an investment advisor, uh, that's an opportunity. There's also deductions for tradespeople that have uh, tools that relate to their work. We talked about deductible and non-deductible interest and how important it is to make sure that you track. And, and, and again, just to reiterate, in the Canadian tax system, it's a tracing concept. You trace what you borrow to the use that you put it. If you borrow for income earning purposes, like making an investment or in stocks and bonds or making an investment in a business, the interest is deductible. If you borrow to buy a house or you borrow for personal use, cars, consumables, the interest is not deductible. So it's very important for you to be, uh, to be uh, careful and also to have very good records so you can support the purpose of your borrowing. 
This just are some of the common tax credits. Charitable donations are a credit. And you maximize your credit if you, uh, are, you, know, if you consolidate your uh, charitable donation uh, co uh, contributions. And uh, so one of the things you should know that if you have a uh, husband and wife and they each make charitable donation contributions, it's typically better for one of the taxpayers to report all the charitable donations rather than split them up. It doesn't matter whether it's in the husband's name or the wife's name, it can still be consolidated on one tax return. So that's important. Child tax credits, uh, children fitness and arts credits, these are all things that you need to make sure you have records for and take advantage of the credits. A medical expense deduction is available. There's a hurdle, you, have to, you only get to deduct it if it's more than 3% of your income. What that typically means is that of the family members, you would like the lower income family member to claim the medical expense deduction and you'd like to combine all the medical expense deductions under the lower income spouse's uh, tax return. Um, the other thing about uh, medical expenses, there's a lot of planning there. You can claim medical expenses in any 12 month period that ends in the year that you're filing your tax return or you can claim it uh, for that 12 month calendar year, but it's a, you have a lot of flexibility depending on when the expenses were, were incurred. Some other credits that are available, caregiver, tuition credits obviously a very important one, both in terms of the student, and the important thing with tuitions is that uh, it's possible to transfer the credit if it's unused to, to the parent, and that's, uh, that's important as well. Interest on student loans uh, are, you know, non-transferable and can be carried forward in terms of their ability to be deducted. These public transit, firefighters, these are all different uh, credits that are available. In fact, one of the unfortunate things is that the tax system has been made fairly complicated with all these credits. What the CRA has done is they really have uh, recognizing that a lot of people who could benefit from these aren't aware of them. If uh, you go to their website, you'll find that there's a lot of information that will help you identify the credits that you uh, will be entitled to claim, and I encourage you to go there. So what are some final important tips for you to know? Very important that you file your tax return on time. Uh, the tax returns are due April 30th, 30th except for those people who are self-employed, and those, uh, the returns are due June 15th. But even for those people where the returns are due June 15th, the actual tax liability is due, is due April 30th. Uh, if you don't file on time, there's a penalty, so very important to file on time. If you don't have a, 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 a very complicated return, e-filing is a wonderful way to do it. It's fast, it's efficient. And uh, as we mentioned before, it's very important to file all family member returns. Could create RSP contribution room, there may be certain uh, tax credits that they're entitled to that will actually give them refunds of, uh, of, of uh, tax uh, when they haven't actually made very much income. So all that is very important to keep in mind. So uh, to summarize, you really need to be uh, informed about what the tax rules say and plan so that you can uh, properly take advantage of them. Uh, you need to understand your rights, and whenever you have a problem with a tax authority, the CRA, the tax ombudsman's often a wonderful avenue for you to resolve problems. So don't feel that uh, it's you against the tax authority. There is uh, somebody there that can give you a hand. Of course, seeking professional assistance in some cases uh, may, may be necessary. Do plenty of pre-planning. Uh, make sure that you define your goals. What do you want to do? Is it safe for retirement? say for your children's education, um, think about uh, who the higher income earner is, who the lower income earner is, all the planning that's possible there. Very good detailed records uh, so that you can both support your claims in the event of any queries from the CRA and in the event that you have a tax audit, it will make uh, that experience a much um, easier experience. Where you have the opportunity, you should uh, defer income Remember that the Income Tax Act is, is uh, designed to uh, capture the maximum amount of tax so that you have to make sure that the deferring of income that you're doing is legally possible, but we've gone through a number of simple ways that are actually legislated for you to do it without any tax risk. Where possible, you want to maximize your deductions, as we indicated, planning around something like interest expense, 
making sure that you have tax deductible interest expense as opposed to non-deductible is very important. Um, there's a plethora of tax credits. Make sure that you uh, know which credits are applicable to you. Use the resources of the government uh, to check out that. Um, maximize your RSP and TFSA contributions. RSP, think about that as long-term retirement. Tax-free savings account, think about that where you have short-term opportunities to save tax, but you do need the cash. That's where you'd want to put uh, money for a TFSA. And finally, make sure that you file your uh, tax returns on time and pay your taxes on time. Some very valuable resources. Uh, we, we have a document organizer that will help you capture all your tax information. It's the best way to make sure that you uh, ensure you've uh, taken all your deductions and reported all your income accurately. We have a, a tax planning guide at the CICA that I think you'd find very valuable. Um, there's also the CRA has some wonderful account, uh, tools. This My Account actually keeps track electronically of your installments, your tax returns and is one that I'd encourage you to look at. The tax ombudsman, as I mentioned, is a person to uh, look to if you have some disputes with the CRA. And uh, there is also uh, the CRA will, in certain cases, deal with uh, fairness if there are some tax problems you have, and there's also a reference there to, uh, to a site. So these are all useful resources. And just going to the general CRA uh, website, you'll find uh, a lot of useful uh, tools and information that will ensure that you have the knowledge to do your taxes uh, appropriately. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, listening to me.